Well, hello, everybody, and thank you all again very much for coming. Um, thousands of people at these uh, attending these expert panel webinars. And uh, it's interesting, just talking with everybody before the show started, uh, we or I thought that this, this webinar, uh, you know, complacency and COVID, it's not over till it's over. I, I thought it would be you know, a bit of an afterthought. I, I thought we might be talking, as I said to Ed earlier, about the, you know, maybe the tail end of a rebound, how to prevent one more aftershock. Uh, certainly the, the title is a little more apropos than I'd hoped. Uh, it's not over till it's over. And I think we're all quite aware that it is hardly over. Um, uh, it almost seems like in some places uh, we're, we're, we're just beginning. Um, but just for those of you who are attending for the first time, the original idea of this webinar series with these experts um, from the leading companies was that we wanted to tackle difficult issues where somebody had to make a decision, like, you know, should our mission statement have zero harm in it or not? And you, you can talk philosophically about this for hours, but eventually somebody has to make a decision. Um, we also wanted to talk about reliable leading indicators. Which ones do you believe in enough to change the course of the ship? We wanted to talk about the importance of leadership, you know, and, and the limitations of, of what felt leadership can do. But we are in the midst of a crisis, and despite, I think, what everybody wanted, at least me, this being the tail end and an afterthought is, is not the case. So. Um, we're, we're going. Let me just briefly, everybody, again, for those of you who don't know our expert panel, let me introduce uh, Ed Stevens is uh, is with ABB uh, Corporate Health and Safety Training globally. ABB, I think, is uh, 144,000 people around 100 companies, 100 countries rather. Um, David Bianco is with Epiroc, and I actually said it correctly this time, David. I think that's the first webinar. I've got it. I've got it correctly. Um, and David is in charge of uh, oh, uh, corporate safety globally. They are um, it, it, everywhere there is mining and mining equipment. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Aparoc, so it's not just where they're they're assembling these big drilling machines, but everywhere in the world where there's mining, there will also have service operations. Um, and uh, and David and I've worked together, uh, same with Ed, for uh, a number of years on different different projects, different companies. Um, Anthony Panapinto, um, and I, hopefully I got it right this time, Anthony. <laughs> um, is, with uh, Procter and Gamble, um, he would be their corporate uh, epidemic pandemic expert. Um, Anthony, I think, has two two PhDs. Um, one of them is in law, and please don't hold that against him, everybody, because he is a heck of a nice guy. He's really funny, um, and might actually dispel a lot of your uh, your stereotype connotations of lawyers. Um, but um, and then last but not least is is Teg Matthews, and Teg is our vice president of business development. Um, but Teg has been working with a focus group of 50, 60 leading companies. Um, perhaps maybe not as big as ABB or Procter and Gamble, but um, and he's been talking with them uh, about obviously pertinent issues uh, of which COVID is everybody's most pertinent issue right now, and whether we like it or not, for a little while to come. So, um, Anthony, let me, uh, as, as usual, if I can, let me start with you and. Um, Maybe just get a, a bit of an update here on um, on on what's what's new with um, with uh, with the virus or with the you know I guess the, I don't want to say the technology if that's the correct word or not but um we we were talking just before the broadcast about that even if there is a vaccine and and Ed you can I think I got this right but hopefully. Um, if it's only 30% effective, if it's not at least 50% effective, then that may not achieve herd immunity. So even while we're all thinking this is taking too long, I think all of us sort of thought there was this holy grail, and now maybe there isn't. Um, so anyhow, Anthony, you uh, 
you you have the the floor, but don't limit yourself to that question. If you've got more um, important stuff to talk about, just <laughs> go. <laughs> yeah, so so let me put this in the context uh, for everyone. And you know, I come from a preventive medicine and and public health background, so I'll I'll, I'll ask you to forgive me if I get into uh, too much detail, but. Uh, you know, let's think about um, trends in how past viruses and, and pandemics and epidemics have worked. There's really four patterns uh, after that first wave, which is that first infiltration of the, of the virus into a community. Um, in this case, it's we have to look at the world as multiple communities. Everybody's a little different, and their experience has been different for socioeconomic reasons, for uh, civil, structural, cultural reasons, and, and I won't go into those differences. But, you know, if we take SARS-1 in 2003, uh, it had some pretty substantial impacts pretty quickly, um, but kind of burned itself out. Um, so in six months, it, it rose and it was gone. So that's one, uh, you know, model that, that we, we have seen. Um, and I still think we're, we're a bit untested with this one on what's happening. The other one is, of course, you've heard of the second wave, and the second wave is really tends to come uh, much like it did with the Spanish influenza of 1918, a uh, 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 flu season later. And in, in the Spanish influenza, it was far worse than the first wave. Um, but one of the key things is, is if you look at the second wave of Spanish influenza, masks uh, played a substantial role in limiting spread, and the, the mask technology at the time was simply, uh, you know, cotton. Um, and social distancing and, and awareness of those things. There's a peak and valley model, which would say we go up and we come down and we have these, these sporadic peaks. Um, and then there's the slow burn where we have these little peaks, little endemic outbreaks, much like China might be experiencing right now, isolated endemic to a local town. Um, and so those are really the four models that we have to think about. And so we have to plan for, you know, all of those things. And I keep getting asked the question, well, where are we? Um, and, and, you know, and, and there's a belief in Europe that they've passed the, the, the wave and they're on the way down to basically burning this thing out. And that's created some complacency in that region. And it remains to be seen uh, what happens there in terms of resurgence. In Australia, everybody thought it was over. And we've seen a, a peak a rise in, in uh in Melbourne this week, uh, and you know, South Korea opened up twice now and had, you know, uh, endemic isolated peaks in Seoul and places like that. So um, it remains to be seen where we go with that. But uh, you know, this week in the news we had, has been a we had five cases in Whistler with nothing for a month and a half, and yeah. we're at ten thousand people. Yeah. So, so the up, message that I up, want they opened up the bars, Anthony, just like what happened in Cincinnati. And apparently the drunk people don't do a good job of social distancing. <laughs> what a surprise. I mean, you know, in a way, ah, okay, anyhow. But uh, at least Ed, they said in Florida, at least they, they they weren't serving alcohol in the bars, but I don't think that was quite enough anyhow. It's Anthony, sorry, C carry on. I didn't mean to interrupt, but uh that's okay. You know, as you and I have talked, Larry, after three drinks, two meters becomes four centimeters. So um, that people people get mistaken there. But uh, you know, the message <laughs> that I want to send, I've been sending it internally um, it, with, with my leadership, with uh, folks in our facilities, and reminding them that, look, this is really a, you know, it is a, a person to person transfer of infected uh, droplets aerosols. It is airborne. I won't uh, argue that one. The closer you are, the more at risk you are, the larger the particles and the more virus they can hold. Uh, the further away, the better. Um, masks are a source control device um, when you have to be in congregate situations. And so you need to think about all of these uh, controls that we've had in place, temperature screening, self-screening by symptoms, masks, social distancing, physical barriers, all of those are, are imperfect tools, but they all reduce exposure substantially. And they're all new behaviors for us, whether we're out in public, in the workplace. Uh, you know, I, I, I had to confront somebody in line at the, uh, at the Walgreens uh, where I was picking up some medication. Uh, they snuggled up to me at the checkout counter and I said, look, there's dots on the floor. What do you not understand about six feet? 
Um, they've laid it out for you. Um, and a person just looked at me. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, the challenge is people are tired of talking about COVID. Um, you know, this requires self-discipline and requires the development of habits. And some people have been working from home and haven't had to experience those habits. So as we bring them back into the workplace, as we ramp up over, over the coming months, we've got to really prepare people um, because those of us have been, who have been in generally understand what we need to do. Um, and I think, again, this is about what are, discipline out in public. It's discipline in the workplace. And those things marry up to, uh, to an exposure equation. Um, and so, uh, again, complacency creep is a concern. Oh, for sure. Well, I, I, I mean, I, going again into the just into the drugstore yesterday and uh, one of the pharmacists has the mask on and the other pharmacist has it on her chin. And the one that's serving me is the one with it on her chin. But there's the plexiglass thing. And, you know, I'm not particularly worried about it all. But I also thought, too, that, um, you know, people in the medical profession ought to probably be trying to set the right example because I think you fuel the fire. It, it's it's more than complacency. It's it's also fueling the denial. Is you see conflicting opinions from experts, or you see medical professionals doing different things. It it leaves a lot of room for the people who just want an excuse in the first place. You know, because the mask is uncomfortable and and it and it's hot, right? Um, but and I, I, I remind well, I remind people, Larry, about that. Even in the 1400s, physicians recognized that when they approach patients with cholera and the plague, they should wear a mask. Now, the mask looked like the uh, the head of a raven, um, and there were actually some scientific basis to the way they designed those masks to prevent uh, cholera. But if we could recognize in the year 1400 from thir call it 1347, that we might need masks to prevent, uh, you know, the spread of disease. I, I think it's 2020, and with all our technology, we ought to at least have a uh, some scintilla of respect for that, as well as for 200 years, physicians have been using masks to protect sterile fields in operating suites. And while, again, they're not perfect, they are a layer of protection that can help stave off the distance and the concentration of viral particles that get spread to your work environment, your home environment, your uh, store environment, whatever environment you're in. Uh, and so that's just a simple message that I have is we really have to manage with discipline or else you could see what happened in Cincinnati this week. We now have a uh, not wearing a mask in public is a misdemeanor uh, with a fine. I believe it's up to $25 for each, uh, each violation if you show up at a store or or a restaurant uh, without a uh, without a face covering. So um, if we don't manage it, uh, someone will manage it for us. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, so so far uh, so far away from that uh, here, in that the you, everybody now is very very complacent about all of this. And then, like I said, we just five cases. Ed, um, uh, speaking of places that uh like florida is where ed's from everybody um and obviously uh in the news a lot ed uh there's seems to be um you know i know anthony just loves this because the the, the virus obviously really isn't too aware of where city limits and county limits are so the virus wouldn't likely know it's moving into a different jurisdiction where there would be different <laughs> control measures, right? So obviously, you know, educating the virus is a key issue here if we're going to have different standards. Um, what's up with all that in Florida, Ed? And uh, is it is it being fueled primarily by complacency? Is it being fueled primarily by denial? Or is it just because of the money and the economics? Well, I have to be careful how I answer this because I don't want to create a political debate. And, and I don't deported, want to bring politics into this from the answer, state but, tomorrow. Yeah, right. I, uh, no, I didn't mean that. I just, but, you know, I, I know, I'm but, curious, though. Yeah, what if you remember, is, is it all three, maybe? Yeah, so I think it's all three. So if you think back to the panel meeting we had a, when we first started talking about opening the economy and we, we started saying, hey, 
we were starting to educate our employees that, hey, the things that we're doing in our facilities uh, to address what Anthony was just describing, this is what good might look like. So if you go out into your communities, you know, and, and you see that restaurants aren't, you know, forcing mass or not, you know, uh, doing some of the things that they need to meet the, just the minimum requirements by the CDC guidelines, then you might not want to hang out in that area. So, because the last thing you want to do is get infected and then bring that back to our community at our facilities, uh, because then we would have to shut the, shut the place down for 14 to 18 days. So, and, and then I made a comment, of, I went to Universal Studios and when we went to Universal, uh, they, right when you get out of the parking lot, you got to put, you know, you're re recommended to put a mask on. When you walk right up to actually go into the boardwalk, they do a temperature check. You have to have a mask on. You have to use the hand sanitizer and they enforce this. So if you went very far with, and you took your mask off, somebody would ask you, please put your mask back on. That's what good looked like compared to everything else going on in Florida. So we had some businesses that really stepped up the discipline and met the minimum requirements that was asked of them and not only do that, but they actually enforce that. So with that being said, if you take a look at Florida, we had a lot of people uh, both on the, uh, the business sector and in the common community that absolutely didn't do anything about it. So in May, uh, what was on television was political figures and those things saying, hey, they said we were going to be X, we weren't X, we were Y, not a big deal, let's reopen, we've, we've got this under control, and we didn't enforce anything, so we had no discipline in the community, and so what happened is, when that happened, we saw an insurgent of these cases, we saw them go through the roof, because we weren't doing social distancing, we weren't wearing our face protection, we weren't utilizing the hand sanitizing stations, we just weren't doing the things we need to do. And in my personal opinion, that's what uh, is causing the spike in the Florida area. Now, if you take that back to our to our plants, our plants, we started enforcing masks and, and asking the employees, hey, you will need to wear these masks from the time you get out of your car until you make it to your workstation. Um, there was a little bit of discipline problem at enforcing that, you know, keeping that because in the in the minds of the employee, just like what you said, Larry, starting out is that we thought we'd be through this by now. You know, we thought by the time we really get through the end of the summer, uh, we're not going to have to wear the mask anymore. The reality of it is, is now we have to take a step back and we have to approach it the same way we did with safety glasses. We require safety glasses in all of our facilities. So the second you walk into the manufacturing area, you need to have your safety glasses on, right? And I, I just got off a phone call this morning and I asked one of our HSC professionals, I said, hey, if I walked out into your plant right now and I didn't have my, uh, safety, uh, my safety glasses on, would somebody approach me? And she said, Ed, you wouldn't get past the aisle. You know, you wouldn't make it very far in the plant. I said, okay, I got another question. If I was to walk out into your site right now and I wasn't wearing my mask, would somebody say something? And she paused and she said, you know, they might not say something to you, but they might tell a supervisor. Well, that that's not good. We need to get to where the employees feel comfortable and empowered enough to, and realize that, hey, this mask carries the same protection that the eyewear does. And, it, and there's a very important uh, reason why we're keeping these and, and get that communication out to what Anthony said. So we're not there to the discipline and we're not, to the level where everybody's like, whoa, this is important because this is gonna help keep me safe. And we're just not there yet. Well, no, and I think it, I think one of the reasons too is that I, I don't think people really wanna, they don't wanna be like, they, they want this to be over now. I mean, right. we're, we, you know, we, we've all been good. I think we all think we, okay, you know, we did our part, I'm now I'm done. Like, and you know, we're not, it's like, yeah. so. Um, David, let me let me move on to you. Another, uh, I mean, Dallas certainly isn't in the news as as much as much as Houston uh, seems to be making it into the the news lately. Um, but you know, in general, it it sort of seems like there was uh, you know a, a lot you know kind of a the, almost like the tide going up and down now. Um, but as you said, part of that is sensationalized by the fact that they allowed 
they allowed elective surgeries to take place and naturally hospitals want to be running close to capacity to be cost effective so you get a new influx of patients it doesn't take long now before things are at capacity so that's as you said to me last night the story behind the the story a bit but um tell us just tell us a bit about what the you know the the rise and fall of complacency in Dallas and Texas and Houston and then um since your corporate office is in Sweden I know everybody'd like to hear a bit about how things are going in Sweden and then, then we can get to get to tag and uh, and talk about the community a bit but Tell us, tell us a bit about what's happening in your neck of the woods, David. Well, Texas is like Florida, experiencing uh, some reopening processes uh, in the latter, mid to latter part of May. And then we had the Memorial Day weekend. And then we had a lot of protests in the larger cities. So there have been multiple sources of uh, potential growth of, of the virus. Uh, coincident with that, uh, back when, uh, because I know this personally, because March 30th, I had to have emergency surgery on uh, retina detachment. So I went into a surgery facility because it was emergency and there was only two of us having surgeries that whole day. Uh, and so, you know, so staffing in hospitals was restricted to COVID and that demand uh, didn't take up all the floors and didn't take up all the need. And they actually, in uh, in April and May started experience layoffs in that industry to some degree. And so there was a bit of a lull and then they brought back elective and non-COVID hospitalization. So they're trying to build that staffing back up. So there's, there's a lot of variables going on in terms of uh, the hospitalization uh, capability to meet the demands. Uh, and now that we now have elective surgeries out of the way, there still are the usual heart surgeries, gallbladders, whatever going on. So you layer that with COVID. And again, uh, it's going to be a peak. Uh, another thing that happened here, and I'd, I'd be really curious uh, in the other locations if you guys run across this, uh, what is the definition of a case? They changed that in uh, May in, uh, in Texas to include antibody testing. So uh, which generally can be a good thing because that kept, tends to mean you've had it in the past and you may you may not be contagious now because you've had it in the past and didn't realize that you were asymptomatic. So there's just a lot of variables going around. But the biggest impact, I think, when you get back to the personal level, and you were talking a minute ago with Ed about fatigue, essentially, we're tired of this, and complacency, uh, is, is that people are starting to know people who've had COVID. Uh, and and uh, we've had had it in some of our facilities, people who had been there and then, you know, the w next week after they weren't feeling well, didn't come into work and then they got tested positive. And then they they did have some days that they could have uh, had it when they were in the facility. And so we are, you know, everybody now knows pretty much somebody who has uh, tested positive and and or been sick of it from and it. Is that, is that, David, is that is that affected? Like, is it it? When I got to talk to people who've had COVID, it affected my level of complacency um, just because it, hearing my brother-in-law tell me how sick he was. Mm -hmm. We my, basically, My, my wife's yeah. main name is Wilson and I have a brother-in-law named Larry. I, I know it's, so I, <laughs> Larry, I know, brother wow. Larry Wilson. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyhow, um, but yeah, he, uh, no, he works, works construction. Um, you know, uh, heavy equipment operator, and uh, the uh, their whole uh, their five of the people, I think only had twenty or thirty people at their company, but five or six of them got really, really sick. They got told, you know, if you get any worse, go to the hospital. So they they all kind of got better in five or six. They'll never be recorded at all. And then uh, just yesterday, I was talking to uh, a new Swedish consultant. Uh, he and his wife and his hundred and two year old mother got it, and he. Um, they're all alive. Every, everybody made it. But you know, talking to people about it definitely, you know, makes. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm trying my best, but I found it gave me a bit more of a I don't know shot in the arm in terms of the motivation for sure. But um, uh, other than like, do you think that's helping then, David? Is is are people now starting to be taking it more seriously in in Texas then? Yeah, I th I think. 
those that are are going to bucket are going to bucket. You know, I think that's just uh, the nature of some people. But I think people that are on the fence are now starting to experience the uh, I know a person because we've gone to all masks in our Garland facility required when you come in the door. And uh, and that was just after we had had some people who had uh, come up positive. So people are starting to realize this isn't just a news story. It's a reality story. And and most of the people are acclimatized to it now, I'd say. They realize that's the climate we're in right now. Uh, the few that really bucket, we just watch them a lot more, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, uh, and that's a bottom line. And, and so uh, I, I think it does start to have that impact that you want to have. And it's unfortunate that it takes that, but sometimes that's the reality. Well, I, I, I told I, I told some folks that I just sent the, uh, you know, the, the course was ready last night. So if you've people I know I sent it to and I said, by the way, I said, when we filmed this a couple of weeks ago, they weren't at 100 percent masks in this facility. They are now. Mm -hmm. Right. That's mm -hmm. but, yeah. you know, I can't. The, the, it's such a moving it's such a moving target that, you know, right. I, don't, I don't necessarily think things like that prohibit, you know, using, you know, you, you using things like self triggering to keep yourself from making a mistake with COVID. I mean, it's I, you know, I'm not I'm not going to necessarily worry about all the B roll, if you will, because it is a, it is a moving target. But yeah. um, take what about the I mean, I hate always throwing you the responsibility of representing the industrial <laughs> world in North America. Tag, you know, besides you know uh, Epiroc, PNG, PNG, and ABB, but um the what is it been pretty much the same as what uh, you know David and, and Ed and Anthony were saying? It's been sort of like the you know right like almost like the tide is uh, or you know where where what about in places for instance where things aren't aren't bad? Right. Um, you know like where or like you know a, a week ago here where it wasn't bad now it's bad right. here now it's right. bad here proportionally. You know, five cases out of 10,000 people is very, you know, is very high for Canada and British Columbia right now, right? Right. But that's how, I mean, Anthony told, I mean, it's, it's going to, it's going to spread like a virus. What a surprise. Um, I guess that's where it all comes from. But what's happening, like, what, what's the general feeling out there? Like, when they show us the map, um, and, you know, there's the states and the provinces where it's going up, and here's where it's going down. Um, Maybe just give us a bit of the collective from both of uh, from both of them. Sure. So um, I, I, I hate to be uncontroversial, but I'm kind of kind of echoing what everybody else is saying. Actually, you know, if, if we'd have had this conversation about ten days ago, um, you know, the, the roundtables that we've been running, we've been talking, as you said, to about eighty different organisations, and the roundtables tied in with COVID. You know, that people were still interested in it, but they were tired of talking about it. Right. Uh, uh, and, you know, they, they, it was kind of, you know, we've dealt with that. We've kind of got the solutions. We've got these things in place. It seems to be under control. You know, it, 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 we, we want to move on. We want to start talking about different things. So if you if you're asking, you know, if, if you if you think about people are talking about things they're interested in, what they're worried about now, you know, they, they weren't really talking about it anymore. But then weirdly, in the last few days, we've had, or I've had uh, people come back to me and just say, you know, these roundtables, we want to carry on with that. So we're starting to see people refocusing on it. I want to, I want to echo something that both Anthony and Ed said. Uh, you know, it, it's the discipline piece and how the skills tied in with that. You know, I'm a, as we all are on this. You know, we're consumers as well as everything else. You know, so we, I, I noticed when people. Uh, wearing masks and they're pulling them down to talk to you which i kind of looking at it well what's the point of wearing the mask in the first place right and then you you talk about plexiglass earlier on the number of people i see kind of sticking their head around the plexiglass to talk to the person and i'm kind of going so so the intention is there but there's a kind of a skills awareness kind of deficit that you know that you know we're picking up on it and i think you know it's it's making sure that organizations understand that. And what are we doing as organizations to make sure, as Ed was saying, if you, you if someone's not wearing 
a, a mask that people are, are comfortable enough to approach them or point on these sort of things. We, we're still on very much a learning curve on that. Uh, and I think the smarter organizations are across that. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're trying to clamp down on that skills piece and also the complacency piece that goes with it. But other organizations, you know, they, they just want it to go away, right? And, uh, and but it doesn't seem to be wanting to go away, right? Yeah, well, it, I, and I'm, you know, I, from what I mean, when before the thing opened up, uh, you know, Ed was Ed was telling me about the, you know, or David, I think, was saying about that maybe, maybe it's going to be ten feet, not not six feet, right? You know, but in, in most cases, you know, hopefully, hopefully six feet. But uh, I, I think. I think there is a, a general acceptance that whether I like it or not, this isn't going away. And I think if you, I think, you know, seven to 10 days ago, I don't know if people were, were there yet, Jake. Yeah. I mean, like it's, uh, you know, I thought this was going to be an afterthought, this one. And as I said before, uh, before you got on today, uh, I, gentlemen, I don't, I don't think this is going to be the last time we're talking about COVID. I mean, I'd love it to be, but that, that I don't, it's not going away any, anytime soon. So, um, but to your other point, Teg, about people, you know, just want to talk about other things. We had 1,200 and some odd people for the expert panel webinar on leading indicators. And yet we still had to talk about COVID a lot because that's actually the, the crisis, right? So we, right. we ended up talking a little bit about leading indicators like complacency and right. seeing people becoming less um, fastidious slacker, if you will, about the social discipline and isn't that just a leading indicator for a rebound so um anthony if i could maybe just a, a bit of more specifically now at, at 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 your company um north america around the world whatever you'd like about the about the complacency uh the leadership group um you know where where's everybody at collectively on this and are you are they listening to you um i guess is uh is part of it um i i would think they should be they would be pretty attentive at this stage yeah and it, and and larry and and folks i mean it, it's different depending on jurisdiction because everybody has a different perspective you know your the the european uh, contingent believes this is pretty much over. You know, they have these really little blips in certain countries. And so my, my, my context and my conversations are a little different with them, which is about, okay, let's plan for, let's do de-escalation in a smart way, not just throw everything out because I suspect, and there's a very strong possibility if we don't have a vaccine, if we don't have point of service tests, um, there, you know, there's lots of things as virus controls that we don't. Um, and immunity is, is one. The presumption that just because you have an IgG antibody that it's functional and it lasts a long time, we don't know that yet. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking with them about let's not get complacent, let's focus on resiliency um, instead of de-escalation. Because, you know, it, we can stop taking temperatures now, we can stop wearing masks now, we can stop... So that's a little different. And that's actually where we were in the US as well until about 10 or 12 days ago when this resurgence started to occur. And again, I, I still believe the world is in phase one. Phase, a, a, a biphasic wave is, is one where you go back to zero and then you have this big, big secondary wave. I mean, that's what we have over the past 100 years of, of modeling pandemics. And there's, you know, these endemic blips, these little blips in China and Seoul, South Korea that are really, they're behavioral based problems. They're trigger based problems. People go to fitness centers. I mean, there's the, the case of the fitness instructor that infected 110 people over about 22 classes because they're up there pumping and singing and doing Zumba. And I called that case study doomed by Zumba. Um, and so, um, you know, we just, we have to get back to foundations. Um, and, and again, so the conversations are all over the place. A couple of things that we're trying to do is get back to resiliency protocols where we actually talk about triggers and how important triggers are, mind triggers and thought triggers and, and really explain to people why these protocols exist. I talked a few weeks ago, um, we've seen an increased use in the site. Um, basically, we created uh, a, a phone app that sort of, you know, uses certs uh, for COVID 
the trigger? Do I have enough hand sanitizer around? Do I, you know, do I have conditions that are conducive to my behaviors? And do I, am I seeing the behaviors I want to see uh, in terms of that? And then, you know, we're trying some, some other things. So I don't know if you can see this. I'm wearing a contact tracing band. We're doing a little bit of experimentation. Um, so when I'm inside the building, someone comes within six feet. Uh, it zaps me. It zaps them. doesn't really zap. It just vibrates. Uh, and then it collects our data, how long we were close together. So we're, we're just trying to mix it up a bit. But, you know, my messages to leadership are we don't know what's going to happen in the fall. We're out of control in certain regions. I don't believe we've exited wave one at all in certain places. And it comes down to your leadership. You're triggering where you don't see the triggers being self uh, exploited to the advantage of protecting people from this virus and rolling that down to the factory floor, to the office floor. My biggest concern continues to be as we bring more and more people back to the office, back to the laboratory, these people who really have been, I, I shouldn't say on the sidelines, but not in the front lines for the past 16 weeks, like our factory workers have around the world. They're having to, they're, they haven't had the opportunity to, to develop these new habits. And as evidenced, at least in Cincinnati, they're not even making attempts at home to do so because the, uh, you know, what, what's happening in the community. And I still see bad behavior on my drive home. I, I circuit through all the restaurant parking lots and see what's going on at the, at the outdoor bars. And again, my theory is three drinks, two meters goes to four centimeters. It's just a natural, uh, you know, effect. Yeah. Yeah. There, it certainly seems to be, I mean, nobody will know for sure, but it, it, it seems awfully coincidental that they open they open the bars and we had five cases within it within a few within a few days. Um, uh, Ed, let me uh, let me ask you a bit about uh, a, a bit about what. Um, oh, by the way, everybody, when Anthony said certs, he that critical error reduction techniques. But uh, Ed, um, what what are you folks? What all are you folks doing? Um, in terms of uh, you know the anything you'd like to talk about really internally, uh, whether it's contact tracing, using tech. One of the questions we had coming in, I want to make sure we come back to everybody is, uh, um, and Anthony just touched on it. You know, any technology you're using, um, not necessarily recommend or anything. Just you know, what are you, what are you using um, for everybody? Again, this this isn't advice. This is just what these guys do. You can take it or leave it. Um, but um, or or uh, or or just uh, you know just what you're doing to you know from a leadership point of view to help fight complacency, Ed, or uh, or are you know maybe you're not. Um, but well, I can't imagine kind of living in Florida, you guys are still complacent. That I can't imagine that would be uh, the case. Yeah, you know, just just take just take a look at our facilities that we have across the United States. You know, as as we went out and we really ordered a lot of PPE and got access to face coverings and those things. Uh, some of our sites are just now going live mandatory face coverings as effective as July 1st because uh, they were in areas that wasn't uh, had a large cases. So we focused the PPE on the hot spots in those areas like that. But, you know, we do temperature checking and we had we hired uh, industrial nurses to be at our facilities to to help us monitor this and collect data. But the reality of it is to really answer your question is we got to a point where they the, the businesses really felt like that this thing was going to slow down in the summer and go away. So even though we're telling the employees you got to wear face coverings when you walk from your car to your workstation, if you leave your workstation, you better have your face coverings on. Um, deep down in their soul, they thought, well, we, we can do this until July, August, you know. But now they're starting to come to terms that, hey, this is not going away, right, anytime soon. Actually, it's worse now than it was when we first started doing all this stuff. So the great analogy, that the conversation piece to use now is the, the, uh, the eyewear, you know. And I keep going back to this because, you know, when, when an employee, we started making it mandatory many years ago that they had to wear uh, safety glasses. We got a lot of complaints from those safety glasses. They fogged over. They cut the back of my ears. Uh, and it is, it is, we would get them new safety glasses. And there was always reasons why they couldn't wear the safety glasses. And this is stupid. 
Why do I have to wear safety glasses when I'm walking in the aisles? There's nothing going to hit me. It's a way to get past that discipline. And then, you know, if if somebody of leadership, a manager, a supervisor would walk into the area, the, the employees would feel comfortable to go up to them and say, hey, I'm concerned about your safety. Do you mind putting on a pair of safety glasses? Those are the conversations we're now starting to have around the mask. You know, if, if I'm in a senior leadership role and I walk out into the plant, and somebody sees me without a safe, you know, uh, a face covering on, do the, do the employees feel comfortable to come within six feet or me or 10 feet or whatever it is and say, hey, hey, sir, you know, I need you to get some face covering on. Because the reason why that's a big thing to talk about now, because when you go into restaurants and you see people that it says they're required to have face coverings, but yet you watch the person behind the counter not feel comfortable to say, hey, Tag, I need you to put some face coverings on or, or don't feel comfortable to say, hey, if you're going to shop in our business, you're going to have to have face. So getting the employees past that. Diggs, to Diggs that heard that all level. his life, by the way. What's that? Diggs heard that all his life, by the way. Get a, get a, right. face, get a face covering on there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so get our employees comfortable enough to say, hey, I, you know, do you, I'm concerned about your safety. Do you mind putting your mask on properly? Then the next piece of that is, is to start having those conversations about those leading indicators. Do we start tracking when, and we, when an employee is within six feet of each other and they don't have a face covering on? Is that a near miss? Do we wanna track that as a near miss, right? Because now they just had a potential of exposure. So the conversation pieces are now starting to change because now masks are gonna be longer than August, September, October, November, right? right. So now they're saying that masks might actually truly really be the new more norm. And if we don't take that serious, this is what we're gonna see. We're gonna see the things that are taking place in Phoenix and Houston and Dallas and Florida, et cetera. So, so the conversation piece, now that we're getting past that complacency, the conversation is now changing. And, and, and we're starting to think about the mask thing a little bit different. We're nowhere where we want to be. We've got still a lot of work to do, but it's about getting people to feel comfortable that and realize that, you know, this is our new normal. So if I'm going to wear a mask, where do I get a cool one, right? Where do I get a good looking mask, you know? Well, that's, uh, that, that's so. and that, that that's part that's part of, that's part of it too. In almost all in almost all of, in almost all of these things too, and getting the uh, you know, getting getting whatever you want, peer group leaders to step to step up, right? In a way of that, you know, it is the the correct. Like I said, the the pharmacist, you know, should recognize that that's you're setting an example, but whether you like it or not, right? You know, you're a pharmacist, right? Um, right. You wouldn't you wouldn't be serving people with dirty hands and dirty fingernails as a pharmacist. Professionally, you wouldn't do it, but they don't see this the same way. Even though this is actually way more important than having, you know, dirty fingernails, right? Um, David, you were telling me uh, yesterday a bit about the um, the contact tracing and um, and what was a contact and some of the difficulty with that. Just just the technical aspect of that sounded fairly challenging to me. And and again, what? If any technology are are you folks using there um, at your facility in Texas and then also uh, you know South America around the world? Well, uh, contact tracing is a is a difficult thing. We are not yet leveraging any technology. One of the one of the things, uh, and I'm sure Anthony knows this too. There's a lot of companies that have cropped up out of the blue who say they can do things now uh, because they have uh, maybe pieces of technology they're trying to cut and paste together to make a solution. So uh, we're trying to be a little careful to see where the real quality is in that. But but from a data analytics standpoint, the questions you have to ask people, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, the definitions are, we're following CDC guidelines in the US because that's uh, the best thing we have right now. Uh, but there's a fair amount of, uh, uh, knowledge you have to have in terms of the right things to ask and what really matters. Uh, an example is you ask, um, as it relates to the person in question, uh, have you been within six feet or less of this person for a duration of 
10 or 15 uh, minutes or more, uh, especially without any kind of uh, face protection. And, and if, if the answer is yes, especially if it's multiple times, then yeah, that's a, that's a contact then. That's going to be somebody. Uh, now, if you pass by them in a room, uh, pass by them in the hallway or were in a room with them and they were on the other side of the room and these kind of things, those things tend to fall off. But, but the conflict comes in, though, when we talk about more, more information or disinformation, uh, is, is you also get experts that then say, well, it's in the air, it hangs in the air, it's just waiting for you. And when you pass it, you might get a whiff of it, and now you're going to have COVID-19. And so that doesn't really square with the contact tracing definition, because people are saying, wait a minute, I just heard on the news if I just walked past it. So you're telling me it doesn't count now? So those kind of things make it uh, somewhat difficult. What we can say is that based on what we have done in contact tracing and what we've seen come back in terms of uh, people who have uh, caught it, it, it is those that have the most, and it's density, it's the amount of people together, it's the amount of time together. Those are the things that really are, are the contributing factors to it. Uh, and, and you have people that go on smoke breaks, let's say, and they have, small areas in these smoke areas and guess what they're doing they're passing a lot of uh things out of their mouth essentially well, through david, the smoke <laughs> david the kids the kids here pass their vape things back and forth to each other just like when i was a teenager and we all didn't have money for cigarettes and we you know share cigarettes at smoke breaks right cigarettes yeah, cigarettes <laughs> well there's yeah, yeah. i mean uh, I mean, it's it's a long time ago in Bethlehem, yeah. but um, I'm <laughs> I'm old guy, right? So, uh, but I mean, yeah. they're doing the same. It's like, you know, if I'm going to say something as cliche, like I can't believe the kids today are doing the same stupid things that we were doing when we were kids. But I mean, it's duh, that's been going on uh, from time and you know, immortal. Forever. Well, I keep telling people, if you you really want to stop wearing masks, start wearing masks. Yeah, that's a great, very, that's actually very catchy. You know, um, the other thing is when someone doesn't follow it, I say, oh, so you want to catch the coronavirus. I see you're, yeah. you're a hey, daredevil. Hey, well, David, that was the making of, David, that was the making of a good bumper sticker. We, we should <laughs> produce that. There we well, go. Well, um, it, Tega, I, I definitely want to come back to you, but I, uh, I want to make sure uh, we, we got to end up more or less on time today, guys. Uh, but Anthony, uh, what uh, I almost want to say, what's going to happen? I mean, you, you've, you've called almost everything pretty much, not to the day, maybe, but within a couple of days, just about. So um, what do you sort of see happening in, uh, in, in the United States specifically, I guess, uh, over the next little while as you, I, I, my guess is that people are, are going to be less complacent and then they're going to get more complacent again and it's it's going to wave and rebound like that until people finally realize um you know maybe a bit like ed i don't know if um the safety glasses thing but more like the life jacket in other words like it's not going away and this is the way it is if you're going to be in the water you got to wear a life you know personal flotation device or it's a fine misdemeanor in almost any jurisdiction anywhere you go but it's also sort of socially not, you know, it's 50-50, the life jacket right now, right? In other words, your your friends aren't looking at you like you brought a beer into church. They're just kind of looking at you a bit like, you know, like that. So anyhow, Anthony, tell us what, what do you what, what do you think's gonna happen um over the next over the oh, next I mean, little while? And then when we have when we have the show on again in three weeks. We can all, everybody can see whether or not Anthony called it right again, but you've been pretty much bang on so far. Well, I mean, we're, we're in this sort of a, a hybrid of slow burn and peaks and valleys, depending on where you are. I mean, uh, you know, Europe, Europe's in a, a bit of a slow burn on a lo local level in Germany. They get little blips as they move along. We're in this sort of peak and valley mode. And I think, uh, you know, what's going to be really interesting to me is um <clears throat> excuse me in um two to three weeks we should know what the outcome of the uh fourth of july weekend looked like and those celebrations and whether people were adhering to uh discipline 
and good habits and practices or not. So, uh, you know, maybe about the time of the next uh, next um, call, uh, it'll be we'll we'll have fresh data in and be able to look at it with a new sense of what's happening. You know, I, I continue to point out to people, look, what we control is two things. We control our habits and practices, uh, so our behaviors, uh, you know, masks and social distancing. Uh, we control our contacts. So are we around people that we know and how congregate are we? How close are we? Uh, what are we doing, um, you know, in those congregate facilities? And what's our risk? And the virus controls just about everything else. They, it controls vaccines. It controls whether, uh, you know, uh, functional immunity occurs. Um, it controls the analytical methods we can use to detect it um, and the testing methods that we can use. So uh, those are all, uh, you know, a bit out of our control. So there are two things that I continue to tell people that will help us now and will help us if we get a resurgence with the new flu season in October and November in, in North America. It really is develop those habits and practices now um, and hopefully you won't have to isolate. You'll be able to be in a, in a good disciplined practice that will enable your kids to go to school, will enable us to, to move freely um, and, and not worry. And uh, certainly not, uh, you know, get the government to ire up enough to uh, start writing uh, traffic tickets for not wearing a mask. <laughs> um, so I, I'd like to be able to predict what's going to happen. I think it's going to be a, a, a hybrid of this slow burn. And, uh, and, and wavy sort of structure until we all get really disciplined. And what I'm even seeing is in some of, you know, remote populations in the U.S. that haven't been hit, um, but still, you know, ratcheted back on, on, on public gatherings. They've opened back up and now we're seeing a few cases in places that we didn't see cases, mm -hmm. you know, two months ago when this thing was really starting its ramp up in the U.S. So that's the best uh, that I can give you at this point. We'll see if I'm right in a few weeks or wrong, you can, and I feel free to let you tell me that I was wrong because uh, this is a, a bit like gambling. The virus uh, knows what it wants to do. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that, but the takeaway, you know, from so much of the conversations I've had with you, Anthony, is is just that. It's that, that uh, you know, this isn't, this, this isn't like something, you know, you can go to Congress and petition for a lesser virus because this is just too difficult for our economy. It, it's not, that's not how it works, you guys. And uh, you know that that you don't make the rules, even though you get to be the messenger that's telling us all the bad news. You know, which is never an enviable position, right? Everybody always wants to argue with the messenger with the bad news because nobody wants the bad news, right? And we'd all like this to go away, um, but it's not going away. Yeah, and there's right? Sorry. and there's no one-off answer. It is a combination of layers of behaviors and protection. Um, that that will help us deal with this, and um, you know I think everybody just has to do their part. And again, I, you know I, I talked about early in, in our in our experiences together here on these calls about the infodemic. I've now reframed it as the misinfodemic um, because it just only gets worse what the mass media and the internet is creating in terms of misunderstanding and inconsistent messages. Uh, about those behaviors to people. So it's a confusing time for, for people. And I empathize with the, the general populace because leaders are confusing them more and more. Well, there's that, there's that too, but I could, to Ed's point as well too, about, you know, we, we haven't achieved a level of social frowning. I don't know, whatever you want to call it, where when people do things like they steal your parking spot we all kind of look at him going no dude you can't do that he was there first kind of thing right you know it's sort of a you don't butt in line right unless you're in europe just kidding everybody um but uh you know the like there's certain things you know you don't burp in a public gathering um that we just you know people have to kind of it's not cool right don't do this it's not like, you know, it used to be you could smoke anywhere. Now you go, you light up a smoke and somebody's, you walk into somebody's house and you light up a smoke, you know, they're looking at you like, who the heck do you think you are? Like firing up a cigarette in my house or a cigar. Like you'd never do that now, right? But before that was totally acceptable and it would almost be like, hey, where are your ashtrays, right? Well, that's, so now... We've we've got to I think you know we've certainly got to achieve that but I, I we're we're a far we're a far 
far cry from it in terms of certainly where where I am. I see, you know, I, I don't see people just dealing with the air component. I see people really still struggling with the the will I or the will I or won't I. Um, once I got past that, I realized just not making any mistakes with new systems and new habits is way more than just making a decision. That's like like the whole slipping and falling thing. You don't just get to make a decision. You're never going to slip and fall again. It takes you know skills skills habits and things to to actually prevent doing this prevent forgetting your wipes forget you know your mask all of all of those kinds of things i mean that's why i tried to feature the your guys stories in our training program to give people comfort in that look even experts make mistakes so if you think you made a mistake the best thing to do is to keep that mistake from getting anybody else infected right now don't don't try to pretend you didn't do it because even the experts make mistakes go go and make sure that you know you're not making this making this worse because one person getting it's one thing it's it's when you go and infect a whole bunch of other people that it gets really bad really quickly anyhow take um I, i've gotta i've gotta let you wrap up here a bit just in terms of where do you um is the collective group out there more more or less aligned with what Anthony uh, what Anthony was saying? Is that it's going to sort of be this uh, this ebb and flow thing, or are they all just really thinking they can hold their breath until this is over at the end of July, and then we can all go back to normal and uh, carry on as as before? You know? Yeah, I, I, I think there's there's that realization that that's not going to happen. Right, and and I think people have been fighting it, and we don't. We, it's what we all want, isn't it? But but I think there's that realization that that's not the way it's going to play now, and so you, you know, so you, you're getting into conversations where people are looking to move on in terms of you know what they're trying to do for their organizations in terms of safety, but they're they're also heavily focused on how does that play in a COVID kind of space, right? So you, you're getting that. I think I think Ed hit on a huge point with, you know, the recognition of the hazard piece, the willingness to impose rules, you know, and and, and like you've been saying, Larry, is that, is that willingness to, it, what was the phrase you used? Social, social frowning was the phrase you used a couple of well, minutes ago. Right? Well, no, but you're right. You're right. That That's kind of where we need to get to. And we're not at that point yet, but that's, that's, a, that's a learn too, right? We, we'll, yeah, we'll, well, I was really, I, I was really trying to get at that in the, you know, in the training program with the, you know, like if you got to the point where there was no, you know, every, no matter where you went, there would be somebody that would be looking at you like you were urinating in a public place, right? Going, what are you doing? You're not even drunk. It's the middle of the day. This is not cool. You don't do that here. You know, that's, yeah. that sort of thing, right? You know, yeah. um, but, Friday but, night downtown wobbling. We expect these sorts of things. But then again, that's where all the social distancing goes right through. Uh, you know, goes to heck in a handbag as well too. Um, but, but that that plays into something uh, again that uh, Anthony said, so, which is resilience. Which is a, a, I wrote that in a big big circle on my sheet of paper here. You know, that that's essentially what we're talking. We need to be resilient. And uh, and so you know what we're talking about the standards, what people are doing, they're consistent, they consistently apply things. You know, so that message, that's how you drive that kind of change, I think. And 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 that's where that's where we need to go. Plus I've also written down if you want to stop wearing masks, start wearing masks. I am going to get a t-shirt with that written on it before the end of the day. I guarantee it. <laughs> well, that's not a, not, not a, not a bad idea actually, or whatever, but I, uh, it, it reminds me to what David said on a previous webinar, which is, you know, if we don't, there's two levels to this. And I think what people are realizing now is that he was right. You're not going to win this unless we get to the, get to the deeper level. Right. I mean, I, you know, that's how I ended the, the the training program by saying, you know, I know it's a it's a line from a funny movie years ago, but you know, remember, we're all counting on you. It, it really is. Everybody's got to do their part. It's not a huge part, but you you've got to you got to do your part. Now, the the next webinar, everybody, is uh, in three weeks, July the thirtieth, at the same time, one one o'clock Eastern. Um, hopefully, uh, the three panelists and Ted can join us. Um, we're gonna have a we're we're gonna be talking about leading indicators. Um, what would make you change? Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, like I said, we've had this on already in the uh, 
India and the Middle East, um, some really big uh, leading organizations. And we all are well aware of organizations that have made a significant pivot based on a catastrophe. But if you come to the next webinar, what you might find is, have any actually made a significant pivot based on proactive leading indicators or, or not? Um, and I think you'll find the discussion uh, very interesting, um, some, somewhat illuminating and, and groundbreaking. But we will talk about COVID first, everybody, a bit, um, just because I, I at least want to get another update from Anthony, and I want to see if he was uh, he was basically right. But hopefully, um, you know, hopefully people are are going to be getting the message out there, everybody. If I could, I'd like to leave you with one um, one thing from David Bianco. Um, that he, that he was kind enough to put on videotape into our, our program. And that is, when you're talking to people out there about COVID, just just remember to talk about concern. Um, you know, they maybe they don't think it's that serious, but as David says in the thing, maybe they lost a loved one. You, you never know. But um, this this is difficult for everybody. And so, you know, just always approach, you know, people with concern, try to be a bit patient. Um, and, and certainly, uh, you know, if you do, if you do see somebody who isn't doing the right thing, you know, at least like Anthony said, you know, say something, right? You know, if we all, we all kind of say something nicely, that that's going to make it a lot quicker for all of us. And uh, if you don't want to wear a mask, wear a mask. I love it, Tech guys. Thank you very much, and we will see you all July the 30th, uh, same time, same. Uh, same bat channel boy that dates me <laughs> you have to remember adam west and burt ward for that one anyhow um thank you very much everybody and again take thank you all anthony david ed and uh we'll see you all in a couple well three weeks okay you guys later. 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 see you all bye -bye. Take care. Be safe. Bye -bye. Stay safe. See ya.